My name is Aaron. I'm one of the DPhil students here at the Blavatnik School. For those of you who are from the school, thank you for staying beyond class time. For those of you who are not from the school, welcome to the Blavatnik School, this realm of you know, lots of wood and light that comes in in natural forms all the uh, way through the day. We're very glad that you're here for, for this session on country branding in public policy. Now, um, Usually with these sessions, what we will do is we'll have a speaker come in, do a presentation, and then there'll be lots of questions, periods of pregnant silences when nobody wants to ask anything. And then in the last 10 minutes, everybody will have questions and then you know, look very sad when they have to leave because there isn't enough time. So what I thought I'd do today is reverse the order of things somewhat. I'm going to ask you if you have any burning questions. Right? What are the things you really meet, need to ask? And if you don't ask those questions, you would feel really dissatisfied with yourself if you have to leave later on. And we're actually going to start with a few of those questions, maybe six to seven questions that you feel are burning things you want to ask um, our speaker. And after that, we'll have uh, Bak Song, who will come along and, and respond to those questions. And then we'll see how far the conversation takes us. There can be another round of questions after that. Um, and, and we'll take things as they go. Okay, so it's a slightly different format from the usual, but I know it's been done at BSG before. I found that it works. It leaves people much more satisfied as consumers of this session than you, you otherwise would be. And I think it means that we'll probably be able to respond a lot more to you. And that response is particularly important, I think, given today's topic, right? Today we have a speaker in uh, Bak Song uh, who is going to give us quite a unique perspective, I think, uh, on this issue of, of country branding. He's been involved not just inside of government, in the Economic Development Board in Singapore, which is part of the economic policy making apparatus that is involved in marketing the country to multinational corporations. But he's also been involved from outside of government as a journalist and increasingly as an advisor and a consultant on the branding process. So he's very well placed to give us perspectives on both the inside workings as well as the external perspectives of how governments work. And I think this issue of country branding could not be more relevant in a world where you know, we're dealing with post-truth, post-facts, and, and situations where you know, there are multiple competing narratives uh, of how countries depict themselves. Yeah? So at this stage, let me just open the floor to, to all of you and see if there are any, you know, maybe six to seven questions that you want us to, to start off with. And then uh, we'll have Bak Song take the floor, and then we'll ca carry on with uh, uh, open Q&A after that. So who wants to go first? Great. Let's start with you, and then we'll come to you. Yeah. I'm uh, Oh, hang on. Sorry. Yeah, we've got to get, wait for a mic. If you don't mind, Jolie and Lucy will help us with mics. Uh, and just one more thing. Let us know who you are and where you come from so that uh, there's some context behind the questions. I'm um, Omar from Pakistan, and I'm a Master of Public Policy student here at uh, BSG. Um, I would just like to hear your perspective or, or more insights on how to create a country brand versus change the perception or the brand that already exists. So if, you're, if you have nothing and you're creating one versus if you have something and you want to change it, um, how would that differ or what would be some key insights that we could draw from that? Fantastic. So creation of a brand versus the changing of a brand. Yeah. Hi, I'm Liana from Malaysia. Um, I'm also a master's student here at uh, BSG. Uh, my question to you is, I'm not sure whether you've seen online, um, like just two, a few days ago, um, there's a big um, hoo-ha over this Visit Malaysia 2020 logo by the Ma Malaysian uh, Tourism Ministry. Um, it's horrible. Okay, um, so my That's question is, yeah. it is horrible. There's just no way to execute it, then it's just a horrible logo. Uh, my question to you is, in literal branding, so in this case, like we're putting this logo up as our tourism logo, and it's horrible. <laughs> um, could that actually impact the whole branding of the country in terms of everything else? Could, could something be as literal as dependent on one particular logo? Right. So does one part of a brand affect many other different parts? Okay, let's take your question and then we'll come to you after that. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. then Kairos after that. Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, I'm Brandon uh, from Singapore. <laughs> um, I'm a master's student in development studies and I just wanted your opinion on perhaps like the practice of using, you know, the Singapore model of like urban management or like, um, of like governance as an analogue when you export it to like, as you know, like in, t in forms of like expertise to other countries, you know, like like that, that like exporting that country branding in a sense to to other countries, like like in the global south, for instance. So great. Yeah. Okay. So urban governance as a source of exports. Great. Yeah. 
Thank you. My name is Khursana. I'm doing MPP here in Blavatnik School of Government. And uh, I originally come from Uzbekistan and Central Asia. And my question will be more um, in application side. What do you think whether it's better to uh, use and share collaboration or competition when you're building a country's uh, national brand? Thank Can you. Can you say a bit more about that? Collaboration and competition between who? With other countries? Uh, yes, because there is, uh, like many might know, there is a good country index, and they suggest that using collaboration as a strategy towards building a nation's brand is better. Um, I just want to hear your ideas. What do you think is better for a developing country, uh, which is just starting building its brand and um, changing its image on international arena? Thank okay. you. There was a question there, Firoz, and then yours, and anyone on this side? Okay, just make sure you're not in my blind spot. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, I'm Firoz from Singapore. I'm from BSG. Uh, sometimes when a brand is too successful, it might fall into the danger of confusing what is core that made it successful to begin with, with the non-essential. So in your opinion, is the country uh, has started to confuse some of these uh, values, or do you think we are in danger of actually confusing what made us successful and what we think made us successful? So core versus secondary reasons. Yep. Hi, I'm Nicole. I'm a first year PP um, undergraduate reading PP. Uh, my question is, so the Singaporean government has always had a slightly negative image in international media and um, among international opinion. So I have three questions regarding this. One, is this accurate? Second, has Singapore been successful in correcting these perceptions? And thirdly, if so, how can it continue to be successful in doing so? Oh, I forgot to mention I'm from Singapore. Thank you. Okay. I would never have guessed. Um, <laughs> Nazik, and then we'll take yours as well. Yeah. Um, thank you for being here. Uh, Nazik from Kyrgyzstan. Um, very short question. Uh, what, uh, how, the fact that you are a poet, does it somehow affect it, um, your work on branding? Fantastic. Okay. And you. Your Hi, uh, I'm Yaroslav. Uh, I'm doing a master's in Chinese studies here at Oxford. Um, I have a question about the institutional or organizational kind of backup that should uh, be behind the, the country branding. What should be the institutions that underpin the, the country branding? Mm. Okay. Anyone else? Burning question that you really cannot go home without asking. All right, let's take these two. Hey, good afternoon. I'm a I'm a master's student uh, studying in Blavatnik School of Government. Um, your name, sorry? Uh, Austin. Austin. Yeah. Uh, my question is, uh, Singapore is a super good example from a Chinese perspective that uh, a good example about country branding in public policy. So I'm wondering, from a Singaporean's, uh, Singaporean's perspective, is there any country, a specific country, that you guys see a good example and want to learn from? Yeah. So who are Singapore's role models? Uh, Right. Something like that. So to speak. Yeah. Great. Hi, I'm Megan. I'm a um, master's student from Canada studying at the Oxford Internet Institute. And I'm wondering um, what you see with the convergence of branding of digital governments um, and how their branding converges with tech companies and whether that betrays um, the government and the democratic process in their ability to, in their, their pursuit of looking more like a corporate entity. Mm. I think there was one last question at the back. Let's take yours as well. Yeah. Hello, I'm Debel Law. I'm from Lesotho in South Africa, and I am um, a researcher at the Blavatnik School. So I was interested in finding out, so the word branding sort of insinuates uh, superficiality in some way, because there's um, something that is meant to be projected that is not necessarily there. And so I was just sort of wondering um, how you fit in the desire to be authentic and to actually be sort of truthful, because we're talking about post-truth, post-fact, um, in this um, effort to push a positive brand um, of a country. So just sort of interested in your reaction to that. Great. Okay, I think that gives us enough to, to get going with, right? And there's a whole series there, I think, of, of issues about something that you can, you can touch on here, from the very specific to Singapore or Malaysia, in the, in the case of one of the other examples, as well as, you know, this... Sorry, I just... You're okay? Yeah. 
Okay. Uh, as, as well as much broader issues around the principles that underpin branding, the institutions, as well as what the role, say, of, of you know, a secondary art form like poetry might be to the whole branding process. So I'll let Bak Song respond to these in, in whatever ways he sees fit um, as a first round, and then we can see where the conversation takes us. So Bak Song, I leave the floor to you. Um, before I came to this session, uh, my wife told me that maybe there wouldn't be enough questions to last an uh, hour, an hour and a half. But, <laughs> but this is uh, Oxford, so <laughs> no problem with that. I, Aaron actually told me that I wouldn't need to take notes because he would help me to cluster the questions and, uh, and uh, make it easier for me to respond to them. But uh, it look, looks like uh, I'll need, definitely need his help uh, to recall some of the questions since there were, there were so many. But I, Actually, like to begin by responding to the the question uh, from from the back about. Uh, uh, I think there was a uh, mention of the the possible superficiality of of, of brand uh, brand brand and branding that's part of the uh, perceptions, and it's important to start there because it's uh, it's more or less in the realm of uh, definition, and I think we need to set that straight first before we talk about anything else. And I'd like to make a distinction between uh, branding and brand building. For some people, when you say uh, country brand or country branding, they associate it with uh, commercial uh, branding and with advertising. And uh, some people think that there is, it, it's something uh, cosmetic or superficial, uh, as, as, you, as you said. But um, I'm approaching it more from the perspective of looking at it in terms of brand building. So branding would refer to the obvious uh, um, um, actions, like for instance, placing an, an, an ad in, in the Times the newspaper. That, that's a very old school way of of trying to build your, your brand. But brand building is much, um, much more than that. It's like the difference between politics and, and government, or even between governance and, and government. There are many other uh, aspects. The, the example I, I cited, in the advertisement in the Times, is external branding, but there's also the, the whole internal um, part of it. In, in a country, it would mean uh, it would include uh, engaging your own citizens and your residents uh, in the whole um, effort of, of building that, that brand, which is that, that whole internal dimension, to actually talking to and, and, and engaging your, your own people, not, not uh, um, foreigners. Um, and there's also uh, a big difference between branding and, and marketing. In, in the case of Singapore, um, the, the first, uh, our first Prime Minister, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, said in, in a brand forum sometime in the, in the early uh, 2000s that in the, in the first uh, 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 part of Singapore's um, uh, history, what they were actually doing was, was marketing. They, did not even, they had no conception of, of branding. So it, it, branding was done uh, relatively uh, recently. When, when you're, you're marketing, you're highlighting, the, usually highlighting only the, the positive aspects. You, don't, uh, you ignore all the, all the negatives. But in, if you're doing brand building, you can't do that. You have to also uh, take note of the, of the negative aspects and try to, try to deal with them and, and, and engage them in, in some way. So there, there's that whole um, big uh, difference. Uh, th there was also a question about um, how being a, a, a poet or being interested in poetry might have some connection uh, with branding. I would say that uh, poetry can make something happen and certainly can make a lot happen. Because a, a lot of, of brand building is about, is about communication. Um, if it's external communication, uh, today there's a lot of communication get, that can be done uh, far beyond the, the old school ways. You don't have to necessarily put an ad in the, in the Times uh, anymore. Uh, there are a lot of things that you can do with uh, what, it, what it's called with, with no dollar value. I mean, you, you can use uh, social media platforms and many other ways of putting your uh, message out there. And, 
as you all know, the most one of the most powerful ways of of communication is to use is to use metaphors, um, allusions, uh, all the literary devices that uh, are also used in in poetry and and all of uh, of literature. So there certainly is a lot of uh, uh, connection there. Aaron, can you can you help me to yeah, maybe yeah. cluster? All, there are so many other no questions. Problem. So there were some other questions around digital government, for instance. What what is the role that, that branding plays in, in in a digital age, particularly when tech companies are so involved in you know that that whole process? Are governments then more beholden to tech, technical companies, um, or can they function more or less independently? Well, in today's world, a lot of people connect to the outside world through their, their smartphone. Right? They get the news, they communicate with their friends, they do almost everything on their, on their smartphone. So there's really no escaping the, the digital um, uh, dimension. So certainly it is a very uh, crucial part of, 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 of brand building and um, working with uh, digital companies is, is something that uh, uh, there's no running away from uh, since right. Especially if they're dominant players mm -hmm. in, in the field. Okay. What about the first question then? What's the difference between creating versus changing a country brand? I, I think there would be very few instances where, in, in which uh, one would be trying to create a, a country brand from, from scratch. Um, most countries have some uh, history of a varying uh, uh, lengths, even if it's a, uh, a breakaway, um, a newly independent uh, nation. It would have some history, and the the new uh, country, in a way, would have to take that into consideration uh, as well. I guess if you're starting as a brand new country, then uh, there's less baggage that you have to deal with. In in Singapore's case, there are some negative perceptions of Singapore that still persist, although some of them are, are not are no longer based on facts because the the situation has changed, um, and in other cases, Singapore itself has evolved and and moved on. I mean, for instance, uh, some people still think that Singapore is very um, uh, sterile, please, and not much to do. But that's definitely not the case uh, anymore. The arts calendar is so arts and nightlife and entertainment calendar is so full that it is impossible to catch uh, every show. It used to be possible; you could catch every single show in town, but it's uh, no longer. Um, possible and Sing Singapore even um, manages to score um, quite well on um, rankings of, of nightlife uh, surveys uh, around the world. Um, so that there's there's a, a a lot more that you have to do if you have uh, these negative uh, perceptions to deal with. Some of them are what I refer to by this term that I coined called a uh, brand uh, keloid. And just like a physical keloid on your skin, somewhere on your on your body, uh, it uh, you can remove it, but it may be costly and uh, and painful. Uh, it's much better to just well leave it alone, just like a a real keloid, and 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 move on. And when enough people uh, come to know that uh, the situation has changed, then the perceptions would also um, um, be altered. Uh, accordingly. It, it's of, of course true that in today's world uh, something, a negative perception can be can be spread and uh, uh, disseminated very quickly but the reverse is also true. I mean if there's a contrary uh, picture that's being presented that too can be just as, can spread just as fast. So it, it's, uh, I, I would say that it, while it is, and, and the other point is also about the the intense fragmentation of, um, of of the audience and the way that the world is uh, perceived, uh, so much so that although it's true that uh, negative perception can spread very quickly, it's also true that it's it's much more difficult now to reach uh, mass uh, audiences in, in, as it was uh, possible in in the past when there were f much uh, fewer sources of information. There were two broad questions that uh, I thought were useful to look at. One was around should countries, especially developing countries, collaborate or compete with others in their branding? And then the question here about 
the institutions that underpin the, the, the branding process? I think those are actually quite related questions. They're both about the broad approaches that we take to, to branding. So maybe I you think, could touch on I those. I think the question was more about whether countries should try to be more collaborative. Yeah. R right? Um, if if that's the case, that? then, yeah. then I... I, I... Yeah, that, that's correct, right? Yeah. Uh, well, I would say that uh, definitely being more collaborative is the way to go. Mm. Um, even in um, Trump's America, they are trying to collaborate, but in a different way from before. America first is not America alone, is what he told us <laughs> at Davos. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's not possible to just uh, exist on your own. Right? So even Trump's America is trying to collaborate, but in a different way, uh, di different from mo most other mm. countries. But, uh, I think as the, the good country uh, index is, is trying to do, it is, is trying to promote that collaborative um, uh, spirit. And it's something that I think the, most of the world still uh, believes in and tries to aspire towards. And institutions? What, what institutions underpin a good branding process? There are a few uh, dimensions. Uh, the most, uh, the one that people may pay most attention to would be the economic um, di uh, uh, realm. And here, we need to cross three T's and dot one I. The three T's are tourism, trade, and talent. And the I is uh, investment. Um, tourism is the is one of the the areas that um, grabs most people's um, attention. Um, in, in, in Singapore's uh, case, we received something like 15 million tourist, tourist uh, uh, visitor arrivals a, a year, a figure that surprises some people. And in, in trade, we have more than 20 free trade agreements and collaborations with more than 30 countries. And then talent is an interesting uh, aspect for Singapore because in, in today's world, much of the the thinking and the, the emphasis is, is against uh, uh, immigration or holding back on, on immigration. But Singapore is moving in the opposite direction. That despite what you read in the headlines, there is still a long-term um, goal to, to, to promote immigration in order to uh, address the, the, the issues that we would uh, face as a country given our low fertility um, uh, rate. And an investment um, is is based on how, how uh, business friendly uh, you you are. I, as, as Aaron mentioned, I used to work at the Economic uh, Development Board, and there the the metaphor, uh, poetic device, uh, used is that wh while it helps your cause to have the air cover of a effective country brand, you still need the ground troops to, to capture terrain. In the case of the EDB, we have um, of, of EDB officers who are uh, knocking on doors and meeting the captains of industry uh, around the world on a daily basis. And it's, it's that kind of direct marketing that uh, um, you, you might not see in the, in the obvious um, media platforms, but it's it's that kind of direct marketing that, in some cases, is the most uh, effective. Cool. There were some Singapore-specific questions as well. Uh, Firas's question about, you know, can countries become too successful and end up focusing on non-essential things rather than the, the core things that make up the, the, their brand strengths? As well as, uh, was it Austin, your question, what's, who is Singapore learning from? And, and who are the role models in Singapore's branding process? In, uh, in earlier decades, uh, Switzerland was cited as a, as an, uh, as a country that uh, or Singapore could aspire to as a standard of, of, of living. This was in the 90s. But currently, I don't think that there is any specific country that Singapore is trying to uh, model itself after or trying to, to emulate in terms of building its uh, uh, country brand. Uh, last, uh, in August last year, there was a new brand concept uh, launched by Singapore's. It uses the tagline, Passion Made Possible. Um, it was launched in the UK in October at the London Cocktail Week. And this is actually the first, first time that a, 
there is an effort to, to create a, a mother brand, if you like, for, for Singapore. Despite its uh, um, successes over the earlier decades, Singapore is operating on the basis of the successes of its sub-brands. So there is this um, uh, relationship between the, the mother brand and the sub-brands. The sub-brands uh, refer to the sub-brand that's created for the three T's and the, the, the I, the trade, tourism, uh, talent, and uh, investment. Each of them has to have a slightly different sub-brand that is communicated in some cases directly with the audiences. So one question could be, should we focus on the mother brand or the, or the, or the sub-brands? Mm -hmm. Here, it's, it's a bit like the, uh, the American writer Malcolm Gladwell's parable of the perfect pasta sauce. He tells this story about how there was an effort to, to look for the perfect pasta sauce until people realized that that exercise was futile because the market actually wants diversity. They don't, we don't all want the same pasta sauce. And that's why when you go to the uh, Sainsbury's, the, the shelves are so, so full and um, with all kinds of flavors and uh, uh, sub flavors. So in, in, in a, a simplistic answer might be, it is first you should focus on your sub brands because, and especially today, um, given the aspect that we talked about earlier about uh, the, in, the fragmentation of, uh, of the audience and the uh, uh, development of, of different uh, interest groups, people are, looking at the same thing from a slightly different um, aspect. And we don't all want to be similar. In fact, we all try to be individualistic and different from everybody else. So, so it, it, it's interesting that it's only now that Singapore is beginning. It's uh, the, taking the, the first step towards a mother brand. It's not there yet. This is just the beginning of uh, the journey. It, this, this new country brand that was launched last August is a collaboration between two, two agencies, the Singapore Tourism Board and the Singapore Economic Development uh, Board. And they, they are now trying to get the, all the other government agencies uh, on board. Whether they will succeed uh, or not, uh, I, I'm not, I'm not sure. But, but what it, this is, does show th is that the successes at the sub-brand level are more can be more important than the, the, the mother brand. Of, of course, there are many other country examples uh, where much less effort has been um, invested and, and, and harvested in terms of the, the sub-brand. So we are looking at things mostly from the mother brand uh, level. So actually, this mother and sub-brand uh, issue links quite nicely to your question, right, Liana, about does the tourism branding for Malaysia affect the broader systemic branding? I think in your question, you, you cited the, the logo, right? Um, that, that's an interesting too, because the, the purists, uh, purist practitioners of branding, there are some who actually advise against even having a tagline. Uh, in 2010, there was a brand concept developed for Singapore. It went, it, it was, a very upstream way of looking at it. There were, it was after a very long um, consultation and research process, it was distilled down to four attributes, like for example, dare to do, and and. Is that the your Singapore? No, no. It's called the spirit of Singapore. It it because it it never. So it was at the conceptual level, and civils civil servants were meant to use, use this ad brand attributes and embed it into whatever they were doing in all their different uh, sub-brands. A very um, upstream way of doing it. That's a very purist way of branding. Um, but uh, in, in this latest uh, uh, brand concept, there was an advertising agency involved in the implementation. And they managed to um, win the argument. So we, we, there is a, a tagline, the, the one I mentioned earlier, passion uh, made possible. My, 
my my own opinion is that it, al although I can appreciate the purist approach, it does help to have a, a tagline, but it is. There are many attendant risks, um, and and it's it is a very difficult process to begin with. Very difficult to find something that that's that's nice. Actually, Malaysia truly Asia, in my opinion, was very nice. It had a catchy song as well, and. You should have yeah. you should have stuck with it, but the problem with um, with with uh, um, uh, people working in public service is that the for instance the CEO of the agency changes, and what do they do? They want to come up with something new, yeah. Yeah. you know, and, and something that was good was, is discarded. In some cases, this process happens on an annual basis. Because most of us, whether in public service or, or in the private sector, uh, have an annual work plans and are, and are evaluated on an annual basis. So what happens is every year you, you might even chuck out your own great idea last year in order to demonstrate to your boss that you're, you're still uh, putting in effort. So um, un unfortunately, it, it is still helpful to have a tagline, uh, mostly because it it captures people's attention. And in today's world, yeah, that's even more important. In the past, when you had, in some countries, only one uh, new newspaper, uh, it, it was less less important. But today, it, it is even harder to capture people's attention. So if you've got a great idea, something catchy, it, it was it certainly uh, um, useful. And that's true of the logo as well. And, and usually when a, a logo is launched, there'll be some, some um, um, negative reaction and it's something you have to, ha have to live with. So it, it's important, but uh, full of risks. Yeah. There was one last one uh, from Brandon, I think. Your question about urban governance and urban management as an exportable for Singapore. So a slightly different angle of the brand compared to what we've been talking about in, on the economic side. But this links a bit to your role as you know, associate editor at the Center for Livable Cities and some of the urban governance modeling that they're doing. Um, just thoughts on that? Uh, yes, this actually also um, expands the, the discussion that we were having uh, earlier about the uh, relationship between the mother brand and sub brands. And uh, so the brand building can happen in, even in a, in a, in a conference. Um, you know, in, in situations you, which you would not normally think of as uh, as 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 brand building. So, in, in Singapore's case, livable cities, the ci the livability of, of city living is is an, is an area that Singapore has been more more active in. For instance, um, the the event, the World Cities Summit, the the, the signature event of, organized by the Centre for Livable Cities, uh, Urban Redevelopment Authority, and other other agencies. It is an area that uh, Singapore has um, been quite active active in, and it is certainly one of the platforms to to share share best practices and other other uh, 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 ways of making uh, city living more 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 livable. So so certainly yes, it, it's certainly uh, an, an aspect that Singapore is active in and can be. Um, added to it, uh, uh, a country's uh, brand attributes. Great. I think that's actually the first lot of questions done. Why don't I invite you to take a seat first, so we don't have you, you know, standing and completely exhausted by the end of, of this session. Uh, but I think that started us off quite well, actually, you know, in terms of the, some of the broad issues that we, we want to explore. Would anyone like to follow up on any of those questions, first of all? So, and I'm going to take these in groups of about three, I think. So not as many as 11 this time. Um, but I think we'll see how we can cluster these as we go along. Yeah. Hang on. Just wait for the mic. Hi, I'm Sarah. I come from Hong Kong. I'm doing a master at the BSG, and um, I have several questions. The first two would be about some tensions when we are, well, I'm doing city branding. So, um, like, we, I think we have discussed the, the, the um, tensions between the message you want to project and the, the message or the brand you, you yourself from Singapore want to project uh, versus the impression that the outsider's audience um, already have. So I, I got 
that your your view is that um, you you still do what you want to do and try not to think too much about the 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 the, the perception already have. But I I was I was thinking that the tension between like if the the image or the message you want to project is like really too far away from from the perception that people already have. So how should I try to make my message or make my image uh, more acceptable uh, to my audience? So this is the first dimension of tensions I can think about. Sarah, and the, I'm going to restrict you to two questions oh, to start okay. off, and okay. then we can come back to you okay. later this time. And the okay? second, yeah. second um, dimension of tension is that, yes, we it seems that we have more diversity within the country and the city, but we have, in the globalized world, we have becomes, especially for cosmopolitan cities, actually it is more, more and more homogeneous. So when you have different adjectives for one country, you, you, you have um, different sub-brands using different adjectives, different descriptions within a country, and then those descriptions and adjectives actually overlap with those used by other countries, especially, say, Hong Kong and Singapore. So, so how how these tensions about like um, projecting? Well, Singapore is a very diverse city versus, but we are different from other cosmopolitan cities. So, so how 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 can we deal with this dimension of tensions? Thank you. Okay, so that's one lot. Who else has questions? Let me just get a rough sensing. Okay, um, I'll come to you two later on. Let's take these two at the back first of all. Yeah. I told you they'd be easy questions, right? <laughs> nice, <laughs> simple stuff to deal with. <laughs> Go on, yes. Thank you. Um, thank you for your presentation. My name is Fola Shadian. I'm a researcher here at uh, BSG. I'm from Benin, the Republic. Um, so my question relates a bit to what you said about uh, brand building as being first an internal process within the country. Um, in the case of Singapore, has this been exclusively an internal process, or have um, have you also been associated to external actors? I'm thinking about marketing agencies, international communication agencies, um, as it is a case um, in other countries, both in terms of building the brand but also promoting the brand. Uh, and my second question is: now that Singapore is considered as a model in terms of uh, brand building, does it also provide um, advice or best practices sharing with other governments? Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Tony Nettison. I'm not a researcher, I'm not a student. I'm, I'm planning to do a PhD and I'm looking at various topics related to public sector and capacity. My question is about the the role of iconic uh, mega projects in in cities and the extent to which uh, they lend themselves best at times and worst at times for country branding because in our case as in south africa i'm from south africa uh, we've got two probably quite uh, knowledgeable projects in the world on the one hand we've got the biggest uh, power project that is probably associated with the biggest scandal globally uh, but on the other side, we also got some of the smartest rail projects, rail projects, the Gauteng Rail, which is globally known to be one of the smartest rail projects currently in the southern hemisphere of the world. And so my question really is the role of, uh, of these mega projects, you know, and they are iconic um, in positioning countries, as in case in Paris, Eiffel Tower, and so on. And I just want to know what is the status of that. I serve on the board today of that, of that entity and we're looking at positioning the country around a particular kind of iconic initiative. Thanks. Great. Let's work with those three, and then we'll take the next three. I saw a list of hands already for, for, for the next round. Um, tensions between the message we want versus the impressions people already have, diversity in cosmopolitan global cities, internal versus external actors, as well as uh, is Singapore giving advice to other governments, and iconic mega projects. Um, on the the first first question on brand, or I think it's a question about brand authenticity. I think that the difference between looking at it as marketing and branding is that when you understand 
the, the whole brand process and you're looking at it as brand building and not just marketing, then it also forces you to be, become more, more authentic. Um, it's a bit like a, um, like a bank or a, that always looks for fresh funds or a, a credit, credit card company that always wants to increase its customers. But when you want to cancel your card, they, they uh, don't have no time for you. You know, most organizations uh, focus on the, on the front door. I mean, just like all of us, our, our living room and our front door is, uh, is beautiful and always maintained, but our backyard is a complete mess, uh, not to mention the attic. So in marketing is a bit like that. I mean, uh, this is very simplistic uh, generalization, of course, but uh, when you're marketing, you tend to take that approach, the, 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 the approach of the bank or the credit card company. But if you are looking at it as, as building a brand and then it, 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 you take a much more holistic approach to it, then you have to look, take care of your backyard and your attic as well. And not to mention um, edg nudging your residents to also chip in in the maintenance uh, effort. Um, on the question of uh, whether it is uh, internal or external, actually, the internal uh, focus on the internal dimension of brand building in Singapore is fairly recent. The international um, um, uh, successes that Sing Singapore has uh, managed to achieve was done mostly through external um, uh, communication, both the, the uh, obvious um, old school ways of getting your message out there as well as uh, on the ground direct marketing as, as I mentioned uh, earlier. It, it was only in the recent years that, uh, that there was more um, engage, uh, genuine and, enga and comprehensive engagement of, of, of the people. And this latest brand concept of, of Singapore takes it, it's a, it's, a, it's a game changer, it takes it to a whole new level. One of the main aspects of the brand is to use citizens, real people, with their real life stories as brand ambassadors. That's quite different from creating an ad where you, you pay actors to enact or a scene or, or, or play a role. These are real people telling their real life stories and not only that there is also a very collaborative aspect to it like for instance when the the new passion made possible brand for singapore was launched in the in the uk at the london cocktail week in october the, the, there were two british uh, authors who had written a book about the best bars to go to around the world who, and they were invited to launch their book at the singapore booth at the london cocktail week so these two British writers uh, um, enjoyed the, the publicity and the promotion uh, as, together with uh, all the other people who had, who had come from, from Singapore. So, so the, 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 this um, kind of um, um, an engaging of, of real people of, with, with genuine and authentic stories and with an and not just one narrative, one tagline, and one logo, but with many, many uh, stories. I mean, it, the way it's summed up is that uh, the, the aim is for you to think of Singapore not as a, a place with, with, uh, where you can do something, but a place where you can be something. So uh, whether you are, I mean, if you're a tourist, you can um, Fulfill your 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 travel uh, uh, dreams or, or, or desires, or if you want to work in in Singapore in the in the travel industry or other industries, that's uh, also possible too. So that uh, two major ways of of being, uh, either as a visitor or as uh, a resident. The question was also partly about: Is there a role of external agencies, right? So international marketing and advertising firms versus more local efforts. So what, what's been the balance in, in your experience? Well, in for country um, branding and brand building, it's 
you you always trying to get the message through to uh, a target audience in another country. Yep. So it, it, it's it, there's no running away from working with um, uh, experts and lo lo with local knowledge uh, on the ground. Mm -hmm. So that 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 aspect is is essential. Yep. Okay. And then the last bit was is Singapore giving advice to other governments? Um, y yes, and in in there are many agencies that are working. Uh, with other countries, but sometimes on infrastructure pro projects, like for instance, uh, um, master planning a new capital city in India, uh, various other 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 projects. But these are not they they're not. Uh, I I I'm sure the people who work on them don't uh, consciously think of that they are involved in in building the country brand. But that is the the outcome or the effect of of what they they are doing. I don't think they necessarily see it as giving advice either, because Singapore's conditions are quite specific, and they're not easily transferable to, you know, other history or or cultural type uh, settings. So, so the where where there is that attempt to to share, it's usually the an attempt to share with the caveat that it can't be universally applicable, and people will need to think about how to adjust and contextualize this to their own situations. There was a question about the iconic yes, uh, iconic mega, mega project, project yeah. and. Uh, well, certainly, they they are very they can be very powerful. In Singapore's case, the Marina Bay Sands and integrated resort has, in effect, become the national uh, symbol, e eclipsing all the others, uh, the Merlion or National Arts Centre, and many others that are much smaller in scale. Uh, well, size does matter. Um, uh, the Marina Bay Sands uh, appears in almost every visitor's mm. selfie and many people have, have got it on their must-do list to to swim at the infinity pool on on uh, level is it 57 or 58 yeah. yeah so so they can be very very powerful yeah i mean there are singaporeans who complain that why is this commercial entity why has it become the national symbol and not some other uh, public building but uh that, that's the way it is. Uh, there, there are many other uh, public buildings that, that also grab people's uh, attention, although they're much, they are smaller in scale, like, for instance, the National Gallery and the uh, Gardens by the Bay. So uh, again, it is uh, operating on a sub-brand mm. basis, but of course, if you're big, um, you tend to get more of the attention. Great. There was one last bit of, uh, from, from Sarah, actually, about uh, s global cities and how they're all quite similar. So how does a global city like Singapore differentiate itself in, in its branding uh, effort? Actually, you, you mentioned yeah. the, the aspect of multiculturalism. Mm. And uh, in my opinion, multiculturalism is the X factor for Singapore now at its current status of its, of its uh, brand. The, the, the reason I say this is because there are many unusual or even unique aspects of Singapore's multiculturalism. Like for instance, it's a uh, it's public housing uh, system where there is a, there is a government uh, regulation and, and, and uh, rules and even legislation to enforce the, the ethnic composition of every single apartment block of public housing. It used to be by ethnicity and more recently it was a uh, uh, um, expanded to also include nationality. There's a certain rough uh, uh, quota. Uh, and then there are many other uh, efforts, community eff and grassroots efforts to sustain uh, Singapore's uh, multicultural uh, um, uh, harmony. So t to me, that, that's the most important um, uh, aspect and it, it's, it, it's something that makes Singapore stand out, I think, from, from other nations, especially in, in today's world. Okay, let's see if we have time for at least two more rounds of questions, but if not, at least one. So there's one at the back here, and I promise you both that I would take your question, and I'll take yours as well. Yeah. Hi, my name is Mihai Klapenyuk. I'm from the Republic of Moldova, and I'm a diplomatic studies uh, student here. So uh, I've read that before, and I want to ask you, how do you address criticism that country branding is an exercise only for uh, rich countries? How do uh, smaller countries and maybe developing countries can promote better their, their brands. 
And uh, second, more specific, uh, within your strategy or um, policy that you have constructed for Singapore, what uh, indicators of performance do you use? Uh, is it just tourist numbers? Uh, how do you quantify the the reach of uh, the brand? The brand, sorry. And um, or should we think of it as a long-term perspective only? And very briefly, I'll share nope, a paradox. I'm cut you off there. Sorry. Just if we, if we all do three pi tripartite questions, we'll never get to the end. This of it. is so not. This is just a, a, uh, how a paradox. How okay. a brand can kill a brand. Uh, all right. My country has branded itself as hospitality tradition mystery, and if too many people come to discover the mystery, then there is. It's not. It's not part of the brand anymore. It's like a paradox. It's more an right. anecdotal. Okay. Yep. Great. Thank you. Well, well, the mic moves over. I'll just say that Sidney Brenner, the uh, Nobel Prize winning uh, biologist, uh, once said that performance indicators or KPIs sh should actually stand for killing performance indefinitely. Um, <laughs> I have to say I have a great deal of symp sympathy for, for that idea. I think we have one here, Jolie. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, my name is Zaid Ahmed. I'm from India also from the Diplomatic Studies program. Um, a follow-up question on the internal and external aspects of uh, country branding. Uh, I want to know, the, usually the effects of, the external effects of country branding are usually on tourism and investments, you know, bringing investments to the country. But what about the internal effects of country branding, especially for a country like India, where you have so many states, so many people, every state has its own brand. How do you unify that? Is, is the process different? Or should there be a different process where you create brand ambassadors so that they take out, uh, take your brand uh, to different uh, parts of the world? Yeah. So is yoga diplomacy enough or not, right? <laughs> Basically. Yes, thank Great. you. Uh, there were two more here, I think. One behind. Yeah, okay, you take it first and then we can hand it over to the back, yeah. Um, hi, my name is Darren. I'm an um, MVP student. I'm from Singapore as well. Um, I wanted to ask, um, is there a difference between a country's brand and its reputation? And if yes, would you say that one is more important than the other? Okay. And one last one. Uh, at the back, yeah. Thanks. Uh, my name is Tillman. I'm from Mongolia. and I'm also studying uh, public policy here. So my question is more like uh, uh, on the targeting your audience. So you also mentioned uh, like a mother branding and sub branding. So. I mean, in the uh, national context, how it should be like uh, defining your target audience, I mean, in terms of scope and in terms of, it should be like a very broad maybe, but uh, uh, especially in relation with the sub-branding issues, you mentioned like investment, then would be the our targets, uh, maybe international financial institutions or something. But uh, in terms of tourism, maybe it's more like individual level. So how really, I mean, in the government uh, deciding this targeting your audience, yeah, thanks. Great, so another round of nice, easy questions. Yeah. <laughs> um, the, the first question, uh, whether branding is only for, for rich countries, um, again, it's a, of course, the, it's like the, the iconic mega project, the size matters, but it is, you don't, well, as the, there's also another company that says, you don't have to be rich to be clever. Uh, so if you, can come up with a, a, an effective concept yourself, or if you engage a, a, a consultant and come up with that concept, then you're, you're, you're good to go. In today's world, there are a lot of things that you can do, as I mentioned earlier, with very low dollar costs. You can uh, shoot your own video and upload, upload it. You can use uh, many social media platforms that have no upfront um, um, uh, monetary uh, costs. So, there's a lot that can be done, and there are also many other dimensions of uh, brand building which can make use of existing um, um, networks and mechanisms. For instance, the entire foreign service, all your public servants who, who travel, anyone who has any engagement with a foreigner or, or someone who has some influence uh, over your, your country a brand could be engaged in it in that effort. Uh, it, it used to be in, in Singapore that uh, uh, many people would think that country branding or anything to do with country branding is the, is the purview of a civil servant who works in the tourism uh, board or, or some other economic agency. And that's quite far from the, the, the truth. I mean, as we all know, the taxi driver is the, is the first brand ambassador you meet. Uh, 
in every all maybe yeah. even uh, if you backtrack it's the immigration officer or, or the one who tells you yeah. which lane to go to for, for immigration but today it's gone far beyond that it's not just the taxi driver or the immigration official it's it's anyone with internet access who puts something up that someone somebody can come across on online um, so the, the, there's no end of uh, things that you could you could do uh, there was a question about of indicators of, of brand um, value Unfortunately, as, as uh, Aaron uh, alluded to, we live in a world of, of KPIs. Of, so th there's no running away from that, but brand building is one of those uh, subjects that is uh, endlessly frustrating if you're a, a control freak. And there are, I suspect, a number of them in public service, <laughs> as, in, as in any other organization. So if you're off with, with that bent of mind, then it, it's going to be very, very frustrating because how can you change the perception of someone of your country who lives in Venezuela, who came across uh, something about your country on, online? It's impossible. You, you know, you, you, you can't uh, go out there and deal with every negative perception. So just as with um, advertising or public relations and, and the, these uh, similar fields you have to take a broader approach to the outcome or the effect of what you're, you're doing you can't expect a, 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 quanti a readily quantifiable and very visible um, results at the end of every year when annual assessment comes comes around it just doesn't work that way I mean, there are obvious uh, indicators like numbers. I mean, like this, if your visitor arrivals increases by 50% and that coincides with your brand campaign, then you know you probably get a bonus from your boss that year. But uh, that, that could be correlation, but probably it's more than that. Um, so it, it's much better to take a broader view. Some of the effects are, are long term, and there are also there's also this indicator which I I used to advocate when I was working in the as a communications consultant, which is to, to not look at, for instance, in tourism, the visitor arrivals um, or ticket, ticketed uh, numbers or numbers that you can count uh, uh, clearly, but to look at citations, which is an idea borrowed from the academic world. And today, it, it is much even, well, much easier to do, to do that. Well, what I mean is, you can search for what people are saying about you in a way now that it was not possible in, in the past. So it, it should be uh, much more feasible to include that in the, in the range of, uh, of, of, of methods of, of measuring how you're, how you're doing. Yeah. And there was a question about, uh, about India, about su sustainability. Um, here I want to, I want to say, say a bit about the aspect of social sustainability. Um, we hear a lot of talk about an, an economic and environmental sustainability, but there's much less said about social sustainability. And social sustainability can be applied even to an area like, like tourism, which most people may not um, um, have thought of in the past. But in, in recent months, it has actually even made the headlines with the problem of over-tourism um, like in places like in Venice and, and elsewhere. And there's also the, the phenomenon that is, is much more obvious, the backlash against, uh, against immigration, as we have seen in the UK with Brexit and also in uh, Trump's uh, America. So to the policy makers, there's a... There's a uh, a cost-benefit um, analysis that they're making with all these efforts, whether to promote um, I tourism or immigration. But to the the person on, on the ground, person who has to, to deal with noise and competition and all the other uh, uh, negative externalities and uh, effects, then it's a different. The cost-benefit calculus is, is is quite different. So social sustainability is something that's also um, important and, 
And here it's definitely in the realm of brand building rather than branding. Someone who's only doing branding would probably neglect this uh, totally. But uh, if you're not careful, then problems will arise uh, further down the road and it will be much more difficult to deal with it uh, then. There was also the issue of what you brand, right, in India's case. Is it the big national brand or the state brand or the city brands? How do you deal with these nested overlapping? You have people from Punjab, you have people from the south, you have people from the north. Mm. There's so many different brands. How do you have a unified brand? Should that be like a different exercise in unifying your brand um, so that people take their brand outside a different mm. you know, area around the world? So. In, the, in the global network of people who talk about the livability of, of, of cities, uh, there are some people who uh, suggest that in the future everything, all the action will be at the level of cities. Um, in, in other words, uh, the, the state, the government becoming increasingly irrelevant. We were already seeing some effects of that. If you look at London versus uh, the UK or California and the USA, uh, Catalonia and Spain. I mean, there, there are more examples. Uh, the people are, uh, well, essentially in line with the way we live our lives now. Everybody wants to do their own thing. Take the best Instagram photo. Uh, be different from everybody else. So whatever the state is trying to tell you to do, if you're, if you're a city, you're the city mayor, and you have, a, you have a authority unlike uh, Mayors in Singapore, uh, they, don't have, don't, they don't have as full authority as, uh, as in, in other countries. Yeah. Um, you, Same you, term, you, different meaning. You have more, <laughs> you have more room to, to do your own thing. And, and it is true to a large extent that uh, cities are actually competing with other cities rather than with other, other cu countries. Um, so that's one way of, of looking at it. Mm -hmm. And there was an, also a question on the, how, how do you decide on the target countries? Yep. In, in Singapore's case, it is uh, done in a, very, uh, deliberate, in a very deliberate way. Um, it's almost like a military operation. I mean, you study the terrain, the, all the, the relevant factors, and then you mobilize your, your troops to to capture the terrain. So it's done in a very deliberate way in all the sub brands. Yeah. Like earlier I mentioned the example of the London Cocktail Week. That's as specific as you could get. Oh, yeah. After, the after talk, studying, will, yeah, go on, after the next time, I'm going to ask Darren to do a session on the role of military metaphors in Singaporean <laughs> policy planning, uh, just so you understand why it's so deeply ingrained in the psyche. But that, that's for next, next time. I'll let you finish. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, and also, uh, just one last point about the London Cocktail Weeks. After studying the, the customer and knowing that uh, you, have to do, if you, you have to do it over, over drinks, like that's the best way to, to get your message across. Mm. Yeah. There was a question about brand versus reputation. Are they the same thing? And if not, how are they different? Um, I, I would say that uh, reputation is, uh, is a subset of, of the brand. Uh, because the brand, to me, is a very, very, very holistic. It's, it's almost anything could affect your, your brand. In, in today's world, anyone and anything can influence your, your brand. I mean, an ordinary uh, man walking on the street could do something crazy, and that's it. Your, your country brand just got, uh, got, uh, got knocked. Yeah. Um, so, so brand is much, much bigger than, than reputation. We've got about slightly more than 15 minutes. So I wouldn't, maybe I'll take another two or three questions to wrap up. And then I want to give Bao Song some time to just say some, some remarks that, that you know, kind of summarize or maybe capture his, his parting shots for, for all of us. Uh, Abdul, I know you had a question. Did, uh, any, who else? Anyone else at the moment? OK, so let's take these three, and then we can wrap up with those. OK, hi. Yeah. Um, thank you for your for coming here tonight. Uh, my name is Abdul, I'm from Sudan. I'm studying also the MPP course. So I've got two succinct questions. I know you'll be happy about that. So the two first good. one yeah. is, uh, what, what do you think for a developing country uh, is the most cost effective way of doing branding and marketing? Is it like the kind of direct marketing, 
uh, the kind of troops and, and that kind of stuff, or is it actually just focusing internal process? That's the first thing. And the second thing is, uh, what do you think is the, in your career in branding, what do you think is the common pitfalls or the common mistakes that actually people fall into? And it's, it's a no-go. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. And you had a question as well, right? So my question would be, what would what was the biggest challenge or the most complicated hurdle you faced while branding Singapore or any other um, initiatives that you worked on? And, and how did you overcome those? Great. And one last one. So what do you think you should do when uh, international media, especially Western media, keeps uh, branding you a certain way despite the reality on the ground? Uh, and sometimes these two can be very different. OK. Okay, the yeah. first question, um, for developing country, I would say the most uh, um, cost-effective way to, to start off is to use, um, use, use digital platforms uh, because they, well, that's where most people are paying it. I mean, that's where their attention is, yeah. and that's the first uh, resource. And also, it's a... It's a place where you can do you can do things uh, with with less less dollar cost. Uh, you just need a well. You need to have people to pay attention to, maybe like update websites or upload stuff, and and they can do it as part of part of their work. And they they're doing other work as well. Uh, it's it's possible to I could imagine in a public service to get more people involved in it, not just the X number of people who work in the tourism board, but other all other civil servants as well. Why? Why not chip in? I mean, it's all uh, you're all in the same uh, same boat, uh, literally. So th those are some of the first things you could uh, start off doing. Um, pitfalls. I would say the biggest pitfall would be to neglect the internal dimension. I mean, there are people who think of branding as a totally external exercise. So if I've got all my advertisements um, vetted and sent out, that, that's it. I have, uh, check the box and I can uh, uh, take a break. Uh, it, it doesn't work uh, that way. It, it goes back to what we were talking about earlier about uh, authenticity. Uh, if it's not authentic, then it's never going to, to work. If, if the aspect that you're trying to promote is immediately contradicted by the taxi driver or the immigration official, then uh, you've got a, the, uh, an uphill, uh, it, it remains an uphill task. Yeah. And actually, just to use the example of Passion Made Possible, right, the brand that, that Boxong mentioned earlier, a lot of that actually had significant time spent in terms of internal stakeholder engagement, not just external. Um, I say this because the job I did just before coming to, to BSG involved overseeing both tourism and manufacturing, so that that branding process was something very close to, to our work. Yeah, sorry. The, the next uh, question is about the, the biggest, biggest, hur biggest hurdle faced. Yeah. Um, I would say it's when good ideas are not uh, um, given the, the, the a fair hearing, um, let alone accepted and, and, and implemented. And these ideas can come from, from anywhere, from the most junior member of your, your organization. But is, there is a, there's this um, a truism in the world of consultancy that uh, when you're a paid consultant, then the same thing that you say, uh, people suddenly sit up and pay attention. But the very same idea, suggested by one of your own members of staff, and especially a junior member, uh, would never uh, uh, get anywhere. So un unfortunately, that, that is uh, still the case. And there are also other, other biases. I mean, oh. let me look at your, your I mean, talking about the, uh, relation, the perception of, the, of consultants by, by government clients. Uh, let me look at your education, your track record, even your ethnicity. Um, so these are all uh, unnecessary barriers to the the good ideas that are out there, but uh, um, some or well, many will never see the light of day because of uh, many factors, including this one. Um, the last last question is about the um, Western media. Um, 
there's this analogy that I, I, I uh, um, li like to use to describe the change in the attitude towards uh, negative um, uh, uh, reporting or ne negative uh, 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 perceptions. In the past, in the pre-internet uh, world, each time there was something negative said about you, say in, a, in the Western media or, or any media or anywhere in the world, some public servants or politicians will react as if it was a tennis match. So if you serve one ball, I'll, I'll make sure I serve it back or as hard as I can. I'll, 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 I'll try to smash. In, in today's world, there is so, much, so many balls being served that uh, it, it's not, uh, it, some of the time it's not tennis anymore, but it's more like a, like a video game in which there are, could be hundreds of monsters at every level that you're at in the game. And it's impossible to shoot down every monster. Just need, you just need to shoot down enough of them to get to the next level. Again, for, can you ignore the... It's like whack-a-mole as can, well. Uh, right? Just keep trying to... <laughs> ignore the rest of them. So I think in a, in a, in a, <coughs> as a summary, that it's a bit like the, the shift that has happened in terms of uh, uh, dealing with uh, the foreign, foreign media yeah, or foreign perceptions. I'm a huge fan of the idea as well that if you, you know, some of my old bosses used to say, um, and a friend of mine who works for Hillary Clinton once had told me that she told him as well that if you don't attract incoming fire, you're not targeting the right things. So you want some amount of pushback on things as well because otherwise it means you're not really doing things that, that are relatively worthwhile. Um, so I think we need to be fairly philosophical about that. That may explain part of the reason why we don't feel we have to shoot down every single argument as well. Because, I mean, some pushback is part of life. Yeah. Any other thoughts on this? No. No? Okay. Okay, we've got, we've got just under, under 10 minutes left. So I thought, I just wanted to, to, to ask Bak Song to, you know, not, not summarize what we've gone through because we've covered a huge amount of ground. You know, and and I, I want to be thankful for all of the questions, actually, that, that you guys posed that allowed us to do that. But I, I wanted to end on a bit of a personal note because many of us here are practitioners of, of public policy or we are interested in working in some aspect of the, the practice of either policy or global diplomacy or international government and, and development. And what I was curious was, you know, if you had to summarize your experiences both in and outside government right, and, and say, distill that into three to five pieces of advice for people who might be embarking on a brand building or a brand making effort. What would those pieces of advice be? Oh, actually, yeah, for a bit more than that, I have uh, six. No, that's fine. Six will do as well. <laughs> yeah, I have six points. I, I jotted it down. Um, it's kind of like the well, six things you should think about doing. Okay. If you're in your policy, uh, public policy work, Great. you yeah. need to do anything that has any relationship right. so with. So for those uh, who were on Facebook the, earlier, the you know, brand. this is the bit that you can actually um, take away. <laughs> but of so, course, no one did that, right? Yeah, no, never. <laughs> So uh, n number one is to begin with the end in mind, um, which is to really uh, appreciate branding and brand building as opposed to marketing or, or any, anything else, and especially its internal dimension. Uh, we've talked a bit about that uh, earlier, but that, there's actually a, a lot more to, to discuss. Uh, number two is to, is to manage the relationship between the mother brand and the sub-brands. In a way, it, in Singapore's uh, earlier decades, this problem didn't exist because we were operating mostly at the level of sub-brands. But now that we have this mother brand, um, it's int it'll be interesting to see how that relationship develops. So it, it is necessary to manage that relationship. The third is to try, point number three is to try to partner the private sector um, wherever you, you can. In, in Singapore, it actually has a, quite an um, uh, uh, interesting uh, situation in that there are Singaporean companies that operate overseas that don't highlight their Singaporeanness. For example, there's a Singapore company that has a logo that looks um, quite British, you know, it's like, like a coat of arms or something like that. And they're quite happy to be mistaken for a British company in the countries where they, they operate. So 
Singaporeans who are who work in the field of business don't tend to wear their heart on 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 their on or rather their flag on their on their sleeves like the say the typical Japanese businessman or the American businessman. I mean, it, from the from hello, you know uh, where they, where they're from and uh, they're they're, they're um, projecting their country brand in every interaction. The Singaporeans are. Uh, much less like like that. But if you can harness that en energy and that potential, um, especially in countries that have a very uh, successful uh, private sector, then it, that can be a very uh, powerful um, uh, means. Uh, number four is to engage the people, just like the Blavatnik School did with its open day last Saturday. Um, you know, the people engagement, the co community is is essential, and the people can be your your best um, brand ambassadors. As I, I, I think Singapore is just discovered after so many years with its latest uh, brand concept. Uh, number five, uh, don't don't try to direct the the sub brands or the what what other organisations are doing. That have an effect on the on the mother brand, but to but nurture them, nurture the total environment, and then when there are successes, uh, showcase the best examples. So it it's a bit like so it's it's a bit like chemistry where you're trying to be the catalyst, or gardening where you can't um, pull the 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 shoot to make it grow faster. I mean you have to just Ensure that the conditions are fertile and ripe, and then um, enjoy the harvest when it when it inevitably will if you take that approach. And uh, number six is the is to factor in any of the un, unintended consequences into relevant policies and and uh, initiatives. Okay. It's a, it's a great summary, I think, of, of well, not quite summary, but you know, a great set of takeaways in terms of very specific steps that people can, can start with it if they are undertaking this kind of, of, of effort. Um, I want to end by, by thanking you for, for joining us. I started by saying that you know, he, he would present us a perspective both from the inside and outside of government, and I think that, that omnidirectionality has certainly come through in the, the remarks and the responses to, to the various questions. I want to thank all of you as well for, for the questions because those are often what give sparkle and, and fire to, to these sessions. So I hope you'll be back at the school again before too long because there will be many practitioner-led sessions like this. So both for our students and, and those who are you know, from the broader Oxford community, I hope you'll join me in uh, you know, being back at the school and, and for this specific instance, of course, thanking Buck Song for joining us this evening. So thank you. Thank you.